Welcome everyone um, and thank you for coming to uh, the info session for the Master of Heritage Conservation Program at the USC School of Architecture. And we're really excited you guys are here and interested in learning more about our program and um, and we're interested to for you to meet us and for us to meet you. Um, so we uh, Cindy Olnick and I are your hosts. I'm Trudy Sandmeyer, and um, I am the director of the Heritage Conservation Program, and uh, Cindy is my um, partner in crime here, uh, and the associate director of the program. And uh, so we are um, excited to uh, chat with you this evening. And um, or where, whatever time zone you're in, I saw just saw somebody chatted from the Philippines. So good morning. I think. Gold star. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's morning in the Philippines. I'm not sure. Uh, but in any case, um, so I, I also wanted to um, uh, mention that we are, um, I believe, live streaming this as well for those folks who cannot get access through Zoom. Um, there will be a live stream available and for those participants um, who can't chat in um, they are you all are welcome to uh, send us an email at this email address the arcgrad at usc.edu uh, if you if you have questions if you have comments or whatever we are going to be keeping an eye on the email um, Elia Marshall is going to join us a little bit later she'll be looking at that uh, and so we want even if you can't interact with us in, in real time, live time on Zoom. Um, we do want you to reach out and, and participate if you can. Um, and certainly that email applies for anybody else too, but, um, but certainly uh, for those who are live streaming. Um, Shall we do the poll? Sure. While we're talking about the agenda, that's a great idea. Yeah, excellent. Okay, we would love to know if you remember uh, how you learned about this extravaganza <laughs> this evening. So hopefully you're seeing that. If you could uh, just let us know, that would be very helpful. Thanks. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. Um, so I wanted to just briefly um, go over what we're gonna do in the next little bit of time. Uh, so you sort of know the roadmap. Uh, so first off, we're gonna just start talking a little bit about the program overall and introduce ourselves to you and then have you introduce yourselves to us. Um, and we'll talk about some of the nitty gritty of the degree, just the MHC degree and then the dual degrees that we offer. Um, and then some other options, if maybe the degree programs are um, not for you, maybe there's other ways that you might want to be involved. Um, and then Cindy's gonna talk a little bit about what do you do after you have this degree? Like what are some options that might be open to you? What are our alumni doing? Um, and then Elia will join us at seven to talk about, again, some of the nitty gritties of uh, the application process that kind of pieces you need to submit and um, a little bit about scholarship information and things like that. So, um, and then we'll hear from you. Although if you have a question at any point in time, please feel free to type it into the chat and Cindy's gonna kind of be keeping an eye on it while I am blathering on about this and that. And um, so uh, we'll try and answer your questions in real time or get back to them if I, if I, don't, if I don't hit it in the course of the presentation, so. Um, so that's the plan. Okay, and thanks to everybody who participated in the poll. We have um, most of you, so I'm gonna wrap that up so we can move on. Great, thank you. I don't know if you, uh, if you care to see, but there you go. And uh, thank you for letting us know, that helps a lot. Yeah. Okay, I think that's good. All right. All right. So, um, uh, move on. All right. So, this may be an seem like an odd image to start with, 
um, but there's a reason. So um, this is a this is a just a normal looking fish. This is the idea of this is the heritage conservation program in the School of Architecture at USC. We're kind of a smaller program. We're very um, uh, I don't know. Dare I use the word bespoke? We uh, we really um, have. Uh, a small number of students and it's a very high student to faculty ratio um, and for all of those things having said all of that um, very boutique uh, level of program um, this is what we look like in other people's um, minds and this is what we look like in our minds um, <laughs> so this is this is the the idea that we are the little tiny blowfish that looks normal until something comes along and then we we poof ourselves up um, and we are um, we are involved and um, getting getting the word out there in a big way, even though we are a small program. So uh, that is that is my it's like my mascot um, that I'm always this prickly little blowfish guy. So. Um, our program is, um, you know, we cover the basics of heritage conservation. Um, and so, so let me, well, sorry, my lights go off occasionally, so you won't mind the light show as I try to turn them back on while we talk. Um, uh, heritage conservation is a term that we use at USC um, and is becoming more and more common in the United States as the term of art for the discipline that we study here in our program. And some of you may have heard of it as historic preservation. Maybe that's the keyword that you searched uh, online or something along those lines. And um, it is, uh, historic preservation is a term that's only used in the United States. Um, and so we really wanted to reflect the fact that the field that we study is is a global field that is multidisciplinary and really uh, stretches beyond the boundaries of, a, of just preserving buildings. And so a few when I first started as director of this program in 2012, we changed the name of the degree um, to heritage conservation to reflect that um, broader identity and uh, set of goals for our program. And so our program is really about um, thinking about place and sites and uh, people and the way that those things intersect. How do we, how do we protect and preserve identify and understand important places from the past that have a role to play in our future, in our collective future. What is that? Um, and, you know, it's not always about ye olde building. Uh, it certainly is about uh, community. It's about um, many things that are common issues of concern. It, in everyday life, things like shelter, things like um, health, um, all kinds of issues intersect with what we do in heritage conservation. Uh, we are part of a national network of uh, programs across the country that teach the fundamentals of this discipline. And uh, our graduate program is um, differentiates itself a little bit from some of the other programs that are out there, uh, in part because we focus um, on sort of three principal areas of study within our program. So one is modernism in the recent past. Um, we are based in Los Angeles, where there is an incredible wealth of modern architectural resources and um, design, uh, landscape design, buildings, communities, all kinds of things that are really different uh, than many other parts of the United States, certainly, but of many other parts of the world, certainly younger than many other parts of the world, but no less challenging to conserve. And um, so we talk a lot about that here in Los Angeles uh, because it's an important part of the built environment here. Um, we also 
talk about um, cultural and intangible heritage. And uh, that also may seem counterintuitive because I think many people think historic preservation is really about saving old buildings. And it is, I'm not saying it's not, um, but it is also about a lot of other things. And um, really one of the things that we look towards in our field is how do we preserve and conserve sites that are important for reasons that have nothing to do with the building that they're in. Um, and sometimes it's about the history that happened there. Sometimes it's about the people who's, who's intersect, have intersected with these places and left an imprint or a mark. Um, and sometimes these are very modest, unassuming places, and sometimes they're not even a place at all. And so how do we how do we think about that? How do we expand our own definitions to include these kinds of conversations? So that's another area that we focus on. Um, and then we also really uh, look to identify, um, uplift, uh, make visible under-recognized communities that have been erased over time, that have um, never been fully made part of the historic record uh, in any sort of tangible way, uh, thinking about um, ideas and places that maybe are not really in the mainstream as we know it, uh, but have incredible cultural importance to the community that where they exist and um, and so trying to sort of reveal and, and, and illuminate those stories of uh, people in places that maybe have been um, not recognized previously. And so that is also another big focus of what we do in our program. And so you also learn all the basics about how to save a building and what does it look like when a brick starts to decay and um, all the sort of nuts and bolts that you need to learn to work in this profession, uh, but through these lenses that we just talked about. So that's kind of the idea behind what we do at USC. Um, this is one of our alums who was sharing his own experience. Um, and, you know, we really, it, it, it's nice when other people say that we're doing interesting and great stuff. And so it's, sometimes it's nice to share those words with, with people. Um, we, uh, we think we're, we think this is a pretty great program. And um, we hope you will too at the end of all of this. <laughs> um, all right, so. Um, we talk a lot about the bigger context of conservation, things like embodied energy, um, which is, you know, part of the sort of building science side of what we do. We've already cut down these trees. We've already made these bricks. We've already manufactured this glass. We've expended this energy and it is captured in this building that already exists. And by conserving and rehabilitating the buildings that already exist, we are not we are capitalizing on that in energy we've already spent versus tearing it down, which takes energy, throwing it away, which takes energy, and building a new building, which takes energy. So we're thinking a lot about this field in terms of sustainability and climate impact and resilience. Um, in the face of um, climate change and, and the impacts of climate change, wildfires, um, you know, tidal changes, uh, sea level rise, all of those things. Um, we're also thinking a little bit about, in Los Angeles in particular, we have a housing crisis. And um, I would argue that many cities across the United States and certainly many places around the world struggle with how to provide shelter um, for people and to do it in a way that is sustainable and affordable and humane. And that's, heritage conservation has a, has a role to play in that. And um, what we know is that often historic buildings are in 
uh, lower income areas. And so how do we address the issues of conservation um, where people are having to make decisions about how they're spending their dollars um, in terms of, you know, sh there should never be a, a choice to make between putting food on the table um, and restoring your windows. You know, uh, there, should, there needs to be able, there needs to be a balance there. And, um, and so we're, we're talking a lot about that um, and, and ways that we can be um, a part of that conversation uh, with job creation, with, um, you know, affordable ways to do rehabilitation of historic places that um, is accessible to everyone and not just certain people. Um, and, you know, we think that it is an important issue of, uh, you know, social, social justice, environmental justice, um, and, uh, you know, we, we kind of like to talk about heritage justice as well. Um, in the ways that um, that recognizing communities and their own heritage is important. So, um, so those are a few of the things that we're talking about. Um, we are talking about places that are older as well as um, places that are new. This is Pico House, which is in the heart of the original Pueblo of Los Angeles, built in 1870. Um, the architect was Ezra Kaiser. This building has been beautifully restored um, and sits still in the heart of the city um, and has become a sort of arts hub um, in downtown Los Angeles. And, um, but then there's places like the Eames House, case study house number eight in Pacific Palisades, um, which is an icon of modern architecture, modern rec residential architecture in the post four years. Very famous. Um, the Eames, Ray and Charles Eames were really important designers and architects who had a huge cultural impact in, um, in post war America in particular. And uh, this is their house, and um, they've recently embarked on a 250-year conservation plan and are just really breaking new ground and doing cool stuff. And it's right in our backyard. And so that's the kind of thing that we can do. We can take blankets and go sit on the meadow at the Eames house and talk about the issues of conserving a site for 250 years in the face of sea level rise and climate change and all of these things. Um, so that's kind of fun. Um, who doesn't want to go do that? Um, we have students who are doing cutting edge work through their thesis research, through exhibitions and articles. This was a, a student exhibit where um, just a very simple thing that the students put together to talk about the intersectionality of um, our our field with landscape architecture, building science, planning, and architecture, and the ways in which um, there's incredible crossover and, and interest um, in those things. Um, and then uh, places that are simple and uh, straightforward, places like Will Rogers State Historic Park, um, which is a place that has great meaning to me personally. and um, but is, this is a historic horse stable and, um, uh, you know, equally as worthy of conserving as the Pico House, but for different reasons. Um, so before we get into the nitty gritty of this, let's go back to the pretty picture. Um, I wanted to take a minute to just in tell you a little bit about me and ask Cindy to tell you a little bit about her. And then we want to hear a little bit about you as well. So um, I am from Los Angeles. I'm a native Angelino. I um, studied history here and then studied uh, historic preservation planning at Cornell University back east. And uh, somehow I always seem to end up back here in LA. I think it's a really interesting place to do what I do to, to study heritage conservation and to work in the field. Um, I came to academia through practice and uh, I, I worked uh, for 11 years for 
uh, the Los Angeles Conservancy, which is a nonprofit organization um, here in Los Angeles, and did a variety of different jobs. But I um, I learned an immense amount working there, and uh, through that, actually ended up coming and teaching as a part time faculty member, and um, and became the director of this program in 2011. So I've been in Los Angeles almost my whole life, which um, is uh, is a kind of gives me a depth of knowledge of this area, which is really um, uh, exciting to me. And um, and and here at USC for a little bit of time now, um, teaching full time. So, um, Cindy, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Cindy Alnick. I grew up in Georgia. Uh, but I have been in Los Angeles longer than I've been anywhere else I'm over 20 years and my husband and I moved here from Boston in 2000 largely for its architecture because we were big modern architecture fans and um, wanted to be around it and the people who loved it so I too got into the uh, preservation field but I came at it uh, from a completely different field. I am a communicator and I did uh, corporate communications and academic communications and um, before we moved out here. And then when I learned about uh, the Los Angeles Conservancy, I was like, oh, of course, that's that's what I should do. So I bugged them for four years and finally they hired me because communications jobs are re still relatively um, new in the field. So that's where I met Trudy. And I worked at the LA Conservancy for 14 years. I created their communications per, uh, uh, department. And then I left five years ago to start my own practice, help other organizations and uh, help advance the field by changing how we talk about preservation and conservation in America, which is sort of a long game, but you have to start somewhere. And so I was thrilled. I've been working with uh, Trudy on the podcast uh, for a few years, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and was thrilled when she brought me on just this past summer to work on um, working, working, reaching out to wonderful people like you and as well as uh, teaching a thesis class. And I'm uh, creating a new uh, class for the spring on communicating the built environment. So I think that's me in a nutshell. Yes, I think so. All right. So we're going to kind of go around the room here. Um, and um, so I know many of you uh, don't have your cameras on, but and you you don't need to turn them on if you don't want to. But um, but uh, we would love to hear um, sort of who you are, where you're from, and uh, very briefly um, what why why you're here at the info session on heritage conservation. So I'm going to ask um, Sean because I can see you, Sean. We'll start with you. If that's okay. Sure, that's fine. <laughs> Hello, I'm Sean. Um, I'm a current student at Cal State Long Beach, uh, getting my BFA in interior design uh, with a minor in design history. Because uh, while being here, I discovered I really like design history. So <laughs> that kind of led me to um, USC for this program. And great. that's kind of my life right now. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's great. Nice to meet you. You too. All right, so Diane. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Uh, my daughter actually sent this link to me, and she's so interested in everything that's happening in Los Angeles. My great grandparents came in 1886. Uh, he was a one of the few uh, first um, trustees of USC, and there's been somebody in my family going to USC for a long time. Uh, I was uh, educated at Fresno State and uh, ended up taking uh, working at National Charity League USC Reading Center in the 70s and i am i'm speaking of 70 i'm 70 now and just 
the family has grown up. I don't know if you do the uh, the book, uh, The City That Grew by mm -hmm. Boyle Workman. I mm -hmm. mean, my great grandparents basically knew all those people. It was a very small city. Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles and uh, my great grandparents uh, lived downtown Los Angeles and they moved west to what was called uh, Westlake, <coughs> which is the well, MacArthur Park area. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I love Art Deco. I love uh, Bachelor. I don't know how to say it. Bachelor. Bachelor. Mm -hmm. Bachelor tiles. My mm -hmm. daughter just bought a house that she was going to redo the whole uh, chimney. Ended up having those tiles. <laughs> That's great. Me. <laughs> so I mean, there's just so many. Glendale uh, Historical Society, uh, Los Angeles Conservancy. I've been here and there with all of them, taking tours. Uh, great. Anyway. So you're a lifelong learner. I like it. So I'm just really interested to see what direction you're going. Great. Well, thanks for coming tonight. Yep. Okay. How about you, Linda? Hi, Trudy. It's nice to nice to see yes. you. Nice and, to see you face to face. <laughs> nice to see you face to face. Um, so I'm Linda Nolan, and um, I have a master's and a PhD already from USC. Love USC so much. But I'm thinking about coming back to do the possibly the certificate program. Um, I teach architectural history, and I've been living in Rome, Italy, for over a decade. And so I'm looking. I'm here to learn more about this program, also thinking about my students who may be interested in doing this program, but also just, as I said, for myself, as I'm making a career change. And I was really excited to hear about you talk about intangible heritage, because that is what I'm most interested in, is yeah. the intangible heritage, especially thinking about UNESCO's rede redefining of what can constitutes heritage. So yeah, I think I'm glad to be hearing more and more. Okay, great. Nice to see you face to face. <laughs> Okay, so um, now we're gonna go. Uh, I'm just gonna randomly pick people. So how about you? How about Charles Prophet? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Charles Prophet. I have a Bachelor of Architecture from Syracuse uh, in 2009. I have a. I moved to LA in 2014 and got a Master's of Architecture from UCLA in 2015. Um, since 2017, I've been a docent at the Eames House, actually, uh, with the Eames Foundation. So very familiar with, uh, with the house. You get to sit on the lawn too. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Every six weeks or so I go out and sit, and sit on the lawn. I'm a registered California architect. Um, I work for a firm in West LA. Um, and so I'm probably more interested in the certificate or the sure. summer program as a way to just kind of augment my career. Sure. Okay. Great. Nice to meet you. Nice meeting you. Okay. How about Alice Lee? I'm not sure if Alice is there. All right. Uh, how about Alcathar Almodi? Okay. Um, uh, let's see, Arthema Chaziri. Hi. Hi. Um, so I got a BS in architecture from Georgia Tech and I've been working at like the architecture firm in Tennessee for like the past few years. So I, I guess it's time for me to like go back to grad school and stuff. I so see. I'm actually, I'm actually applying for the MR program, but I'm interested to learn more about like the preservation, conservation side of things. So I'm more interested in like the certificate side of that. Great. Yeah, we are um, uh, in the process of developing a dual degree with the with the MR program too. So that's, it's not official yet, but it is in process. So when we talk that's about- good the, to hear. Yeah, when we talk about the dual degrees, that might, um, the, the principles that behind it will be, um, will be, you know, similar to what we do with the, with the MR program. So, okay, great. Well, thanks for coming. Nice to meet you. Thank you. 
Okay, how about Christine Amorante? Hi. Hi. Oh, yeah, uh, I'm Christine, and then I'm an industrial designer here in the Philippines. I work in the design and construction industry. And um, here we're actually more exploring about uh, building new construction buildings and structures and seeing this about the British Conservancy uh, made me think a lot about conserving a lot of our old buildings here in the Philippines and I'll let the younger generations of my youth see it when they as they grow. Mm -hmm. So that made me interested in this. Great. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, Thank nice you. to meet you. And yeah. is it morning or what time is it? It is morning. It's 10.30. Uh, it's what time? It's 10.30. 10.30. Okay, well, that's not too bad. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, we try to do it at a time when people who are in all different time zones can come, but um, I'm <laughs> great. I'm glad. It's okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay, terrific. Um, Christopher Garcia. Hey guys, um, my name is Chris Garcia. Um, I'm originally from LA. I'm currently in Salt Lake City on my final two semesters of my BS of architecture program. All kinds of fun. Um, kind of like you, Trudy, I'm being pulled back towards LA. So I'm just kind of looking towards the next year and what that'll entail. Right. Um, I'm also interested in the architecture program for masters, um, but again, also in that heritage conservation side of things. So learning about the dual program is also what I'm here for. Okay, great, great. All right, well, I um, I'm happy to meet everybody here. Let's see, anybody else who wants to weigh in? Oh my gosh, we have so many people online. This is awesome. Uh -huh. May I talk, Trudy? Hi, sure, of course. Name? Yeah. Uh, okay, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rikaw Sarmad Hay. I'm from Saudi Arabia. Uh, recently, I obtained my uh, bachelor's degree in interior design. Uh, in my last uh, semester, I took an extra curriculum about interior conservation, preservation, and adaptive reuse. Uh, that's where um, I know that I want to pursue uh, in this um, uh, and this part of uh, studies. So I'm interested in uh, pursuing a master in architecture for uh, historical preservation in uh, USC. Uh, right. I'm here to learn about it and learn more about the master. Okay, terrific. Well, it's, thank you for coming. Nice to meet you. Um, for anybody we haven't touched base with, we will we will have some time at the end. Um, the good news is we have so many people that um, I don't want to I want to keep going so that folks who are in different time zones um, don't have to leave before we're done. But I'm really delighted to um, chat with folks at the end as well. Um, so I am going to uh, talk a little bit about the the sort of nitty gritty of the different degrees that we offer and um, and the kinds of things that we do. So um, the Master of Heritage Conservation is the um, two year basic degree that we offer. Um, and it is a pretty robust um, set of core classes that are then augmented by um, 17 units of electives and that can be you know perhaps in an area that's an allied field um, that can be a certificate in a different program, for instance, um, you can use those electives for that purpose. Um, but each of each of the courses sort of builds to give you a set of professional knowledge that you can then go out and practice in this field, um, the master of heritage conservation is a professional degree and. Um, so for anyone who's practicing in the United States, um, earning a degree in heritage conservation um, qualifies you to work uh, according to the Secretary of the Interior professional qualification standards. And it is often um, a, a, something that employers are looking for. Do you meet those professional qualification standards? And, and having this degree um, opens that door for you. So that's, that's one thing. Um, the courses that so we'll talk a little bit more about some of the different kinds of courses as we go, but um, 
the program also has an advanced standing um, option. So for instance, if you already have um, an MARC degree and you're looking to add heritage conservation to it, um, we would admit you with advanced standings, which means that you would have less units to earn your degree because you've already done uh, a master's degree in an allied field. Sometimes we can meet that advanced standing through professional experience, um, so it's not only an academic uh, pathway, um, but it basically takes one semester off of the course of, of the two years of study, so you can do it, you can earn your degree in three semesters. Um, and so sometimes that's helpful for people, it certainly uh, can be helpful in terms of um, tuition costs and things like that, so that's one set of options. Um, so a couple of the courses that we have that are core courses that, are, that apply to all of these degrees include things like Architecture 556, which is the class that I teach called Readings in Heritage Conservation Theory, where we read all of these books. Um, and the books change every, every time we teach the class, uh, but it is always uh, a mix of classics, classic, uh, reading with what is the newest scholarship, things that have come out in the last year or two. And, um, and it's sort of like a dorky book club, but it's really, uh, it's pretty great. Uh, it's, my, it's my favorite class, I will admit. Um, then uh, we also do conservation materials and methods with Architecture 551, uh, where we're going out and the students do actually work on a particular site. They produce, they do an analysis and a report for a, um, a local site that needs some evaluation and every year it's different um, and as you can see the students get down and dirty at these sites and really um, really dig in to understand what's going on and what some recommendations for future um, pathways for those sites might be. Um, we do things like documentation where we are doing research and evaluation and documentation of historic sites. Um, these are two of our students at the Reunion House, which is a modern home designed by uh, Richard and Dion Neutra and um, recently acquired by a nonprofit organization that needed some help to understand the history of the house and its development over time. And our students were able to step in and do sort of real world work with the client to provide them with that information. Um, we are out and about in the neighborhoods of Los Angeles. Um, the beauty of USC being really centrally located in downtown Los Angeles is that we are um, able to go out and see neighborhoods that are close to campus as part of our coursework and to do evaluations and work. Um, this was just a few weeks ago in a, in a uh, nearby neighborhood. Professor Katie Horak and her students went out to um, to think about how they were doing an exercise on writing an architectural description. And so they were out um, looking at character defining features of historic buildings in this particular neighborhood and talking about how to describe and understand those places um, from the technical um, architectural description process. Okay. Hang on. We're stuck. There we go. Um, and then uh, we also have, I mean, our faculty are really amazing um, and they're doing, most of them are practitioners who are out in the field doing this work on a day-to-day -day basis. And so this is, um, this just happened this past week. This is our professor, Peyton Hall, who um, has been teaching in our program for many years. He teaches the materials conservation course. Um, and he was a part of the recent um, restoration and rehabilitation of the Egyptian theater in Hollywood um, that Netflix just uh, rehabbed and reopened. And so this is him on, on television last week talking about the work of that restoration. So when I say we have all-star faculty, I kind of mean it. Um, they're, they're pretty great. Perhaps some of you saw, maybe you saw him on TV. Um, so uh, we also have dual degrees and there's three different dual degrees that we offer currently. Um, one is a dual degree with the Price um, School of, uh, I 
forget what it's called, what the actual name of the Price School is, but they have an urban planning degree program. We created a shared Master of Heritage Conservation, Master of Urban Planning degree. Um, what it does is essentially pare down each of these two different degree programs into the core course loads and allow you to do in a two and a half year um, cycle um, to earn both degrees within that two and a half years. Um, and so that is uh, uh, exciting for many people who want to kind of do the government uh, urban planning path pathway um, and uh, or or really any any planning pathway. Sorry, things went crazy. Hold on. Um, we also let's see. It's a little out of order here. Uh, okay, well, we'll skip around a little, sorry. Um, this, this slide got a little out of order, but um, we, uh, as part of our students' work, they are required to produce a thesis in order to graduate. And a master's thesis is just that. It is um, an individual research project that, uh, that tells us that you have mastered the concepts of this, um, of this field. And what you can see from the topics on this slide is that it's very wide ranging set of topics. You're not required to write on one particular thing. Um, we encourage students to write about something that they are passionate about, that they would like to learn more about, um, that got often it's the reason they got into heritage conservation in the first place. It has something to do with their own personal history, their hometown. Um, or a particular place that had a huge impact on their lives, etc. So the thesis process is a, is a part of all of these degrees, um, and, uh, but it can really um, be tailored to your interests um, as, as you go through. Um, okay, things are going bananas here. Hold on. <laughs> um, right, okay. So, um, we also have a building science, master of building science um, degree program. And that is um, the two uh, degrees that we shave a little bit off of both of them and combine them together. You still have to produce a thesis, but you do it through the building science program. And uh, it, um, but, it, but you are, it, it, it's a, the topic has to be relevant to both building science and to heritage conservation. And building science is really about the study of um, building systems and facades and in, uh, interior environmental control and um, all kinds of um, issues related to the built environment in a very um, analytical, data-driven, science-driven approach and which is a which is a big part of our field um, and so this this for those students for those folks who might be interested in this more technical side of things this might be something to consider um, things like just you know cleaning a building what does that look like and how does it uh, how do you do it um, and then we also have a dual degree with the landscape architecture program and that is a little bit of a longer commitment because the landscape architecture degree is a studio based degree and therefore um, has uh, design studio requirements. Uh, we have two pathways uh, that we can do. The heritage conservation degree is 37 units. Um, so again, a slightly smaller uh, path into the degree. And um, the landscape architecture degree depends on if you are coming in with a design background or if you have no design background and you're starting from scratch. So the, what the plus two and plus three mean is um, if you come in with a design background then it's a two-year MLA program um, and if it's if you don't have any design background then it's a three-year uh, MLA program and so depending on your interest and what you've, you know, some of some of you mentioned that you have an undergrad architecture degree, you obviously would come in in the plus two um, category, uh, et cetera. So it can it can make a difference for those things depending on what your academic background is, but it's certainly not a barrier. We have 
the plus three program for the landscape architecture program is actually the largest um, group of students. So that's, um, that's great. And it's a really uh, closely knit synergistic relationship between the two programs. Uh, we share classes and faculty and, um, and there's lots of overlap. So it's, it's a, um, a very uh, integrated um, curriculum. So in this case, this is um, something that we were working on together. This is uh, Allensworth Cemetery, which is in uh, Allensworth, California, which was um, an enclave began, that began in the Central Valley in California um, by a, um, an African-American um, colonel who wanted to create a community um, of self-determination, free from racism, and so created this um, town uh, in, the, in the Central Valley as sort of an agrarian utopian town. Um, and so there's uh, pieces of the town still exist. It's still in a living place, uh, but part of it is now a California State Park. And um, so this cemetery is an issue that is outside the park boundary and um, is obviously in not terrific shape. And so we've been talking a lot with the community about how to um, how to conserve a site like this and help rehabilitate it and tell the story of a place like Allensworth. Um, in addition to the degree programs, we do have other options. Uh, some of you mentioned you might be interested in the certificates. So uh, the certificate is meant to be uh, sort of a, an add-on to an existing degree. So for instance, if you have an MARC degree, you have a Master of Architecture degree, and you really just want to get a little bit more information because what you have found is that the firm that you work for or um, you know, your, your interest in the field really has uh, uh, pushed you closer into the heritage conservation work and you need some technical background in order to be able to you know, do the work, do your architectural design work uh, within the context of heritage conservation. And so often um, we have professionals who who just do the certificate program, it's 14 units as a standalone piece. Um, and, uh, uh, and in some cases, students will get a Master of Building Science and do a certificate in heritage conservation, or they'll get a Master of Heritage Conservation do a certificate in building science. So there's lots of different ways that you can connect to the field, um, even if you aren't doing a complete dual degree. Um, and I think I mentioned at the beginning that the Master of Heritage Conservation degree has 17 units of electives. So if you wanted to add a certificate, you could do that easily within the electives that exist within the program. Uh, we also have a summer fundamentals course, and this is a regular um, course that we offer, Architecture 549. And uh, students can take it either as a four credit class an FOR credit. Uh, it's actually three units. Um, or you can take it as an executive education class. And often students will, or prospective students, will take this summer course um, and uh, think a little bit about whether, you know, try it out. Use it as a way to sort of try it out, decide if this is a field they're really interested in. We cover all the basics of the field. We kind of dip into um, a lot of the different areas in you know, this very multidisciplinary uh, field of study. And so you kind of get exposed to a, a pretty broad area of, of interest. And then um, often we have people, almost every year, somebody who takes the summer course ends up becoming a student in the fall, which is kind of exciting. Um, it's, a, it's a good conversion rate. So um, that's also another option. If, you, if you're thinking about grad school but you're not quite ready to commit, that might be an interesting thing to explore. All right. Um, so um, I'm going to turn it over. Well, clearly I'm going to turn the lights back on. There we go. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Cindy now, who um, is going to talk a little bit about what happens after you have one of these degrees or certificates. What, where do you go from here? Thank you. Yes. So, yes. Yeah, so you come and you get your degree. Now what? Right. Well, the um, 
one of the best things about this field and the reason it's hard to put what it is on a bumper sticker is that heritage conservation can be virtually anything you want it to be. So I will just mention uh, some of the more common um, places our, our uh, alums work. Uh, and you can think of them in, in three really broad categories. There's, uh, there's advocacy, which is typically with a nonprofit, which is, you know, uh, responding to resolving specific issues, putting together campaigns to mobilize the community, uh, working with uh, partners in the community, a lot of grassroots organizing, uh, but it's also it also can be wonky where you're reading environmental impact reports and you're keeping up with legislation. And so you can sort of um, both make sure that the work that you're doing and the solutions that you're proposing align with that, with those policies, but also to advance the policies if they need to be stronger. You know, if we need, we need more financial incentives, for instance, or, you know, property tax relief programs, things like that. There's also um, cultivating knowledge and capacity, you know, everything from like a, a training program for realtors to how to market older properties to uh, a boot camp that the LA Conservancy does uh, in the summer that's sort of like uh, Advocacy 101. And then other organizations, uh, sorry, other organizations do a lot other workshops on, you know, everything from like topical issues on housing, for instance, climate change uh, to, uh, to uh, how to, you know, to the latest in the California Environmental Quality Act, let's say. So advocacy really is a lot of different things uh, and it takes a lot of different skills and it happens at the local, state and national level. And it can be lobbying or it can be um, just like, you know, less, less than that. But, you know, even groups that can't lobby for legal reasons can uh, educate their members let's say, yeah, interview candidates for office on what their views on preservation are and stuff like that. Another big bucket is sort of civil service. So that would be working for the government, uh, which would be on the at the local level, like city planning or community development, where you help to shape and implement the preservation policy. Um, you work with, if your city has a historic preservation commission, you work with them you work with property owners who want to make changes to designated properties uh, so help them walk them through the process help coordinate the approvals uh, managing the designation process for specific sites and neighborhoods um, larger initiatives like uh, historic resources surveys you know you can't you can't say you know you can't save what you don't know you have right you have to know what what is in your town or city that is um, that's particularly significant so coordinating those uh, programs and um, projects and historic context statements sort of the documentation piece of that and then educating the community on how preservation works and how they can participate uh, at the state level there's usually there's a state office of historic preservation that coordinates things like national register um, nominations and designations. They coordinate uh, review, environmental review with the federal government. They provide training and education. Uh, uh, if you're a part of a, a tribal nation, uh, we have tribal historic preservation officers who participate in, in the tribal preservation process and deal with um, not just project review, but repa repatriation of, uh, of uh, artifacts, resources. Um, and then at the national level, in terms of advocacy, well, there's, um, well, there's, you know, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, but there's the national level uh, of government is, it would include like the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, which is part of the, uh, the federal government. And they advise the White House and other um, departments in the federal government on conservation and preservation policy, and they oversee um, certain types of environmental review. But they also have, and especially now, they have a new chair, Sarah Bronin, who's terrific, and she's um, making really great headway and also doing a lot of um, public outreach and education. Then the other, the third big, big bucket is you could put it under the umbrella of consulting. And that can be anything, 
Right here, we're looking at um, architect Kulapat Yantrasas, Cheech Marin, who you may remember from Cheech and Chong, but now he's he's like a you know a world class art collector. And they uh, and then the, to and then on the right is one of our professors, John Lisak, who works for Page and Turnbull, and he. Um, is uh, an architect and so you can so they're actually working on uh, an old library in riverside california and they turned it into this amazing museum that uh that just opened up i don't know a year ago maybe something like that but anyway so so the real sort of nuts and bolts of actually um, doing you know the hands-on work the architecture design planning monitoring construction to make sure they do it in the right way um, but consulting can also be navigating the uh, approval process, helping everything from helping people get tax credits to um, to doing, you know, oral histories on the other side of the spectrum, right? The research and mapping and what kind of places are there in your community? What are the stories that need to be told? So landmark nominations, surveys, um, evaluating projects uh, for potential uh, development. If a developer wants to make changes, they'll look at, you know, the place and see, well, where are the best places we could do that? And how can we make them compatible? Because it certainly isn't about freezing buildings in the past. It's about, you know, adapting them to change, just like they're doing here at the Cheech. Uh, and then there's design development in other ways. You know, one of our, two of our alums, just off the top of my head, are working in affordable housing. Uh, there's uh, community-based design uh, and architecture, landscape architecture, too, that one of our uh, soon-to-be alums is looking into. Um, and some people love being in school and stay and go, they'll go on to get their PhD and, and teach. So uh, really, I mean, tell me what I missed, but uh, there's, there's just so much variety there. And it all overlaps, like all these different types of people work together and overlap in different ways. Okay, thank you. That's awesome. And I think, um, you know, one thing that I know as the person who everybody calls when they're looking to hire someone is that um, we have a couple of, of things going for us in this program. One is that we are um, really the only program on the West Coast right now. And um, that uh, there's a lot going on in the West and um, there are more jobs than I have students and graduates to fill. So um, that's great for me <laughs> and for the students who are getting hired before they're even finished with their degree. And so um, that's a great problem to have. I, uh, sometimes it makes their thesis take a little longer, but I'm, I'm willing to work with people uh, because, you know, um, because the demand is really high. And so that's something to bear in mind as you're thinking about um, what comes next for you. Yes, and I'm sorry, Trudy, I didn't mention the podcast. I'm sure all of you have listened to it uh, fervently and have memorized every episode. But in just on the off chance that you haven't, we uh, a few years ago started a podcast to because uh, we were sitting around and talking and um, it was like, you know, these students do this amazing work and they do all this research and then they have a thesis that just sort of sits on a shelf figuratively. Uh, why don't we just take that work out into the universe and pass the mic and see, you know, let them tell their own stories and what they think is important. So that's what we've been doing. We're in our fourth season and we've won some awards. And uh, I highly recommend that you listen to that because, you know, you, Trudy and I can tell you all, you know, we can talk to we're blue in the face, but you really want to hear from them too. And it's, it's that it's, uh, students in their own words talking about their class projects and their thesis uh, research. It's also alums who are now leading in the field is talking about their really diverse career paths, how they got, you know, into this, the, the field and um, how they see it changing and how they are changing it. So it's, it's very exciting. Oh, excellent. We have a podcast listener on, on, on the line. Thank you, Sean. That's delightful. Um, and, you know, it's really fun to hear our students be so passionate about the things that they care deeply about and have spent, in some cases, more than a year researching um, or our alumni telling telling their story. It is um, it's kind of a thrill for for us and 
hopefully um, for you as as save as save as listeners. Um, okay, and then I think uh, this is our contact information um, for both Cindy and I. Um, we'll just leave this up here for a quick second. You can take a photo of it or a screenshot of it. Um, we are easy to find. We are our our information is also on the heritage conservation page for the School of Architecture. Um, when you go to look at more details about the degree, you can see that there. Um, and you can follow us on social media. Um, yes, I can pop up the thesis page again. Hold on a second. Um, and uh, so social media, we're on LinkedIn, uh, we're on Facebook, we're on um, Instagram. Uh, and you can find us there um, and see what our students are doing and see um, see you know some of the latest things. Actually, Cindy, do you want to put the thesis titles in the chat maybe? Because I want to make sure we um, get to Elia, who's up yeah. next. I will do that. And I also dropped in a link to the thesis showcase. So, so okay. but wait, there's more. But yeah, I'll just grab those and put them in. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Okay, so... Um, we we're, we were going to circle back to questions, but I know a lot of you are interested in the sort of nitty gritty of how to do this. And we have a special guest star this evening who is joining us, um, Elia Marshall, and she is going to talk about um, what uh, what the steps are to apply and how it all works. So, Elia, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Elia Marshall. Sorry, my cat's here. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yes, what's up? I'm the graduate admissions coordinator. Um, <laughs> oh, there. Oh, sorry. There we go. So I'm the graduate admissions coordinator here at the USC School of Architecture. Uh, I'm just going to go uh, through the application process. I saw a question about, you know, uh, certificates, um, applying to certificates if you're applying to the MR program. Uh, I'll address that towards the end of this uh, presentation. Um, so this is a list of our master programs, dual degrees, graduate certificates. If you're applying to a single degree, you only have to submit one application. If you're applying to dual degrees, uh, specifically, you know, the ones listed like heritage conservation science, heritage conservation with landscape architecture, uh, and so on, so on. Uh, you have to apply to each individual program separately. Uh, but there's a benefit. There's a, a waiver application waiver that you are eligible for if you apply to a dual degree program. Um, so I'll just speak about that later and provide a link on how to apply for an application waiver if you're applying to a dual degree program. And then graduate certificates. If you're only applying for the graduate certificates, um, and that's the only you know, program you're interested in, then you just have to submit a graduate certificate application. Um, if you're applying to one of the master's programs and want to add a certificate, if you're admitted to the as a, a graduate student to any other programs that are not heritage conservation, you could add the certificate once enrolled, so you don't have to submit a separate application. Uh, so for Masters of Architecture program, uh, we only use USC uh, CAS. Um, that's the main application that you would be accessing uh, via USC. Uh, and that's where you'll upload your CV, your resume, your statement of intent, your official transcripts, um, test scores if you're an international student, um, and letters of recommendation. And then MHC has a writing sample requirement. Uh, that you could also submit. It would be part of uh, the additional um, application documents um, that where you'll upload that in, that information. Uh, and I'll include the, the links from my slide in the chat after this presentation. So to apply for uh, at USC, you have to submit official transcripts. Uh, we need them to be official copies. They don't, so you don't have to mail us uh, a your transcripts uh, to apply. You could just um, request um, transcripts to be sent to you directly, either digitally or via mail, or you could uh, order them from your registrar and then just upload um, a digital copy. So you could scan them, you could take a photo, but just make sure that you're 
uh, providing both the front and back of your transcripts uh, in case there are, uh, you know, additional instructions or, you know, grad grade evaluation instructions in the back so we could, uh, our, our graduate admissions office can evaluate your, your grade reports. Um, for international applicants, there are additional requirements, um, and it's not just international applicants. Anybody who's obtained a degree um, outside of the U.S., uh, they must meet. They must meet the international um, requirements, country requirements for for those institutions. So there are additional requirements. Uh, you would just go into the link that it's uh, that I will be providing, um, and that's where you'll just search for the country where your institution is located. And then it will list the requirements for those for those countries. Um, there's a recommendation. So this is three letters of recommendation. It could be um, academic, professional, references. Um, but one of the important things to note for this process is that you must submit your letters of recommendation if you're applying for the priority deadline by January 2nd. Um, an application that's submitted without letters of recommendation or pending letters of recommendation will not meet the priority deadline and it will be considered incomplete until we receive those letters of recommendation. So we strongly recommend that you stay on top of your references, your recommenders, uh, and, and confer with them, um, you know, anytime before or after you submit your application that they submit their letters of recommendation by the deadline. And then I'll just go briefly about merit scholarships. So the USC School of Architecture offers merit-based scholarships uh, to both US, US and international students. The scholarships are performance-based. Um, and so there are no additional application requirements or applications that you must submit to be eligible to be considered for these scholarships. Um, if you want to learn more about different types of financial aid, um, uh, the Office of Financial Aid will provide, there are several links in, in that Office of Financial Aid about different resources for graduate students here at USC. Um, domestic students are the only students who are eligible for need-based aid, and that's typically in the form of federal loans or work study. And then international students, unfortunately, are not eligible for those types of aid. Um, and then USC has a scholarship um, portal where you're able to apply directly to both USC non School of Architecture um, scholarship programs. So such as the Alumni Association scholarships um, or fraternity sorority scholarships. For some of them, you don't have to be members to, of those um, organizations, but so it might be open to graduate students. Um, and so they usually start posting the awards for the fall term, like incoming fall term um, around the summer. So after you submit an application, you'll be able to access Scholarship Universe. Um, and I will provide a link so you can start seeing some of those, you know, scholarship programs um, after you submit your application and could start applying for them. So this is just our, our deadlines. Uh, we have two deadlines. We have our priority admission merit scholarship review deadline, which is January 2nd of 2024. Um, and then we also have um, our rolling admissions review deadline, which uh, you can submit an application anytime after January 2nd. Um, obviously, if it's gonna be based on space availability um, and merit scholarship uh, will also be very limited. So, you know, don't be discouraged if your application is not submitted uh, by the second. Um, if you feel like you need additional time, just make sure that, you know, you contact us so we could continue to remind you about, you know, if, you know, if you need additional time. So we could remind you about the deadlines and, you know, try to work with you so you could still be considered for, you know, either merit-based aid or, you know, even just the space to our program. And like I said, all your application materials must be submitted by the deadline. Um, an application submitted by the deadline but missing materials or pending materials will not be reviewed by those the said deadlines. Um, we will just um, wait for until your application is complete to review it and make an admission decision. Um, so these are just some 
Additional resources about admissions, we have an FAQ web um, page in our website where it just talks about the different, you know, just common questions that you may have about the application process. You could also contact me via email um, at artgrad at usc.edu. Um, and then if you have questions about, you know, official transcripts or test scores or anything that has to do with, you know, um, admissions um, that's not necessarily about the program, um, that would be the USC Graduate Admissions Office, which is a central office. Um, and I will send you the link so you could have their contact form to be able to contact them if you have any questions. And then there are application fee waivers that, um, that you may apply for. Um, one of the most accessible one at least for our students would be the dual degree application fee waiver. If you're applying to dual degrees, um, you only have to pay for one of the applications and then your second application will be free. And that is all. So <laughs> if you have any questions, uh, I'll stick around during the, you know, the Q&A uh, or you can send them in the chat and I'll just try to answer them um, in the chat for everybody. Okay, great. And for those of you who might not be familiar, keep that slide up there one second. Ooh. 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 <laughs> Wait, okay. bring it back. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so this is the USC campus and that little yellow thing is um, on our building, Watt Hall. Um, and the building to the right of it uh, on your screen is Harris Hall. And those are the two places that our um, program uh, has classes um, and, and sort of our home away from home in the heart of um, the campus. And um, as you can see, directly adjacent to downtown Los Angeles. So um, we are very uh, much a part of the city of Los Angeles and um, and of its history. So that's kind of great. So thank you, Elia. Yeah. That's, that's can, I add cool slide. <laughs> can I add something? Can I add something? So on the south side of our, our buildings, you will see the streets. Um, and we have an expo line, uh, a train station right there that you're able to access. And then that will drop you off right at the center of downtown LA. So you don't even have to drive or walk. It's just a very easy, I think it's four to five stops and re really quick stops. I think it's less than 10 minutes to get you to downtown LA. Yeah, yeah, I take it. I take it from Northeast LA and it takes like half an hour. It's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Well, I think now is an opportunity for questions. I, I know that there have been lots of things happening in the chat and I think Cindy's been answering a lot of it, um, but I, I will, um, I guess, look to you, Cindy, to curate if there's something that isn't answered, um, and then we can open it up to people who have questions who didn't put it in the chat. Yes, thank you. So Peng had a couple of questions that may have been answered, but I just want to make sure. So uh, does the MHC program require a professional BARC or MARC degree? I said no, but am no. I right? No. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and then we take, there was... uh, we take folks with degrees of any stripe, honestly, um, it really has more to do because everybody brings their their background and interest into the field. Uh, and architecture is one path, uh, but there are many, many other paths. Peng also asked with the with the dual degree options shortening the time of study could having a four year architecture undergrad degree qualify for advanced standing for just the MHC or another two year program? No, advanced standing is really, um, uh, you know, if you have a master's level, like if you have a master's in library information science or in architecture or in, um, you know, any number of things, master in engineering masters of some kind, uh, then that that's the sort of trigger to that. Um, the only exception would be that if you have a four year undergrad architecture, Bachelor of Science or whatever, whatever your undergrad four year program is. Um, if you also have a significant amount of work experience, if you've been in the field for 10 years doing heritage conservation design work, um, that kind of thing, then then we could certainly talk about advanced standing at that point because you would bring that sort of practical um, experience to the table as well. Um, but if you if you are recently out of 
out of school or recently graduating with a four year um, bachelor's in architecture or not be arc um, bachelor of science in architectural studies or whatever you your degree is called, then no, that's not um, that's not a, a, a trigger for advanced standing. Okay, and then Alcathas, uh, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Sorry if not. Asked, are there uh, any specific country requirements? So I think Elia mentioned that a little bit that there um, that there is one of the links that she was going to put mm -hmm. in is about particular um, uh, international you know particular things that international students need to be aware of for each of their countries visa requirements things along those lines. Um, but other than that, we have students from all over the world who come to USC. So um, there's there isn't a uh, a specific other than you know the things that again I just mentioned. Beyond that, no. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. No. Um, and I think you might have answered this too, but is the about the certificate? So Artima is um, applying for the MARC program, and I think you may have mentioned that. Would she also need to do um, another application for the certificate, or can can they get the certificate by taking the required courses while also in the MARC program? Yes, the, the answer to that is the second, um, which is that once you're a student here in a degree program, you can decide even after you come um, that you want to do a certificate. You can you know take a class and it might it get you excited about heritage conservation or building science or whatever. And you can add that to if you have the units within your degree program, you can add it to you to your degree. Um, so yeah, you don't have to tell us in advance if if you are adding it to a, another degree program you're applying for. So Elia, did you want to add something to that? I saw you unmuted. Yes. Um, so yeah. So I mean, if you want to add the the certificate, it would be based on your um, your elective unit. You know kind of like your bank of elective units um, and then working with our academic advisors to officially adding the certificate, just not taking courses will automatically trigger that. So um, is that's definitely um, some, a process that we would do with admitted students. Right. So you don't have to, you don't have to decide before you come. You could do it once you got here for sure. Thanks. And then Peng had one more question. Are undergrad degrees required for the each of the graduate certificates? And I, I think they do. They think that's the case. But if you guys could confirm, that would be great. Yeah, I believe that the answer to that is yes. And uh, are GREs required? No, we do not require GREs. Nope. Yes, as Elia says, they're not required for any of our programs, um, not just heritage conservation, but um, and certainly if you take it and you submit the scores, we will not, um, we will, they will just be a part of your packet, but we will, you don't need to, and um, most people opt not to. Yeah, Elia? We will not include them for evaluation review, so they will not be viewed by any of um, the reviewers. Okay, so don't, if you take them, don't tell them, don't tell us you took them. <laughs> I we mean, we're not going to review them regardless if you submit them or not. So if you have them and you want to submit them, we're still not going to review them. So nobody's going to see them. Um, it's probably just me. Yes. All right. I think those are all the questions in the chat. Um, but if I missed something, please just uh, okay. unmute and let us have it. Yep. Is there anybody who has um, questions? Okay. Uh, let's see. I, I'm I'm sure I'm not saying this right. Al Alcathar, I I know that's not right, but say it for no, me. No, it's really great. So close to the pronunciation we said. <laughs> that's great. Don't worry. Um. If no one uh, wants to ask a question, I want to have uh, to ask you a lot of questions. Maybe Ella will help me with that. Um, so I'm an international student, and uh, I was wondering if um, I attended the spotlight session, and uh, they mentioned that I ha I should provide a transcript in both languages, in country language and in English. 
Um, the cases uh, the institute I got my bachelor's degree from is um, already all the documentation and all the courses are been taught in English. So do I need to translate that? Like we, all the official transcripts are in English. All the official uh, certificates, uh, they're all in English. Do I have to provide um, some kind of translation? So if you go to the country requirements, um, the link that I provided says international students country requirements, um, and you select your country of where you completed your degree, it will mm -hmm. tell you what are the requirements. Uh, if you want, I could quickly check um, what is your uh, I that, um, It doesn't say something about la the language, only an official transcript, nothing about the language. So, so just the official transcripts that you need to submit them both in yeah, it says official transcripts from all the post-secondary institutions and official diploma or degree. But uh, when I attended the official, uh, the sorry, the spotlight session, uh, they said uh, all the international students should have the transcript in two languages, in their language and English. So that's only if that's for specific countries. So if your country doesn't specify that, then it's not a requirement. Okay, thank you. I only have one one question if you have the time. Um, if uh, hopefully I get in, will the acceptance letter will uh, be uh, unconditional or will it be conditional? Is it a full en enrollment? It's a conditional admissions based on you know your final grades. Um, there's going to be a dual, like a degree verification after the fall semester, and so um, after that semester it will determine you know if you continue the program if all your documentation was you know approved there's also um for international students sometimes there is um uh, a sort of two-step process which is that we admit you um provisionally uh mm -hmm. pending additional information that you provide through the application process sometimes we don't have the complete set of information we need so, um, and Elia can more specifically address that, but there, there, there are occasions where um, we may, you know, we may do a sort of multi-step process to admit people. So I think you're referring to the, you know, the uh, financial documentation. Um, USC no longer requires financial documentation to be admitted oh, nice. to university. However, um, you must provide the financial documentation um, right after you certify um if you're admitted um in order to be to be granted an i-20 uh, we are not able to grant an i-20 if your financial doc documentation is not approved mm -hmm. right. uh, where you. can oh, i find no, more answers uh, about um if i have more answers uh, if i have sorry more questions where i can find answers i don't want to take so much time from others you could always email me and I will be actually I just realized I have so many links. I'm just going to after the meeting um, next week, I'm just going to send you an email with the link of this meeting and all the links that I have mentioned in my slide. And and I'll ask also Trudy and Cindy to provide any links that they had in their slides. And we'll just provide all of that information next week. Um, so I can go and apply now, right? The Like the portal is open. Um, it is. It is. You absolutely can. Go in there tonight and have at it. Let's get started. No, I, I still should work in my uh, statement and writing sample. Uh, I saw this uh, requirement and what's the difference between the personal statement and the writing sample? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the personal statement is about, you know, why heritage conservation, why USC? Um, how did you get interested in this field? Tell us a little bit about why you want to pursue this as a graduate, a field of graduate study. Um, your writing sample is really related to the idea that you have to produce a thesis in order to, to complete this program. And so we're looking to see, um, it can be an academic paper from your undergraduate years. It can be um, a professional uh, uh, writing sample that you've produced something that you've uh, written that doesn't have to be very long um, but that gives us an idea that you are um, that shows us that you can create uh, an argument that you can 
that exhibits sort of critical thinking about a topic. It doesn't have to be even a heritage conservation topic. So don't limit yourself. People send us papers about all kinds of crazy things. Um, but really what we need to know is that you that you can write um, and that you can uh, tell us uh, because we don't want um, we don't want to have people who are entering this program who ultimately cannot finish because they cannot overcome that final hurdle of creating a thesis and that you know we don't want to put somebody in that sort of position um, ever and so we ask upfront that you um, that you share with us something that you've written um, that can um, tell us you know tell us a little bit about your skills in that regard so that's that's why we ask is because we don't want to we don't want to get to the end and then um, for you have spent a bunch of money to get a graduate degree and not be able to finish. Yeah, uh, so it, uh, it can be about anything. Um, it can be about anything, yep, absolutely. Can I write, uh, as an interior, interior design graduate, can I write about one of my projects? Absolutely. My project, for example. Absolutely, you can write about anything. You can, it, can be, it can be something you've already written or you can write something new. That's fine too. Yeah. Can I write about, uh, so the country I live in, uh, especially the city I live in, um, is one of the UNESCO heritage sites. Mm -hmm. So can I write about my city? Absolutely. My yep. Anything, anything works. Thank you, Trudy. This okay. Cindy, uh, thank you, everyone. That's okay. a very informative session. Thank you. Good. I'm glad. We'll look thank forward you. to seeing your application. Okay, Pang had another question. Yes. Uh, is the GRE not being required? Does that have to do with the pandemic or will that, is that just the way it is and it's going to continue on? The GRE is no longer going to be considered in, in the School of Architecture graduate process going forward. Thank you. And can applications to the MARC and the MHC programs share materials like recommendation letters and portfolios? Answer that yeah. one. Elia, yes. <laughs> so you could share you could share um, same recommenders. The letters, if your recommender decides to submit the same letter, that's on them. But we are not able to transfer application materials from one application to another. So you'll just have to submit uh, the request for those letters um, twice. Once with for the MHC program. And, a, and then again for the MARC program. The MARC program uses a different portal. So you would just have to use that portal to access the letter recommendations uh, you know, field. So you can use portfolio. exactly the same letter, but you submit it twice. Yes. Okay. And then portfolio requirement, that's only a requirement for the MARC program. I don't think Trudy requires portfolio. I do not, no, no. All right. The only thing we ask extra is um, the writing sample. Okay. Uh, someone asked if we can send the uh, links to the whole group and the answer is yes. <laughs> we will send, if you registered for this, we will send you all of this information, um, all of the links that Elia has been talking about and, and the things that we've been talking about too. So we definitely will. All right. I have a couple of questions. Sure, Sean, tell us. Um, so my first question is, um, I am wondering what the uh, like workload might be like. Um, like for instance, for me, I'm also working and I will be continuing to work and to commute. Um, I've gotten lucky with my undergraduate education and I usually am on campus twice a week. And then maybe I'll take like an evening class online on the other days, but I'm working the other three days. Is that something you've seen that your previous students have managed to do? Or will I be expected to be on campus four times a week or five times a week? Or well, so that there's a lot of things to unpack there, but the answer is yes. Almost all of our students work while they go to school. Um, and uh, that can mean a lot of different things. People work and, you know, do internships, they do work study, they, um, they have, you know, full-time jobs in some cases, which I did, you know, be full-time work and full-time graduate school is very hard. So <laughs> I, I would not recommend uh, that people go down that path, but it, it has been done. Um, 
but it is really hard. Um, one of the things that is helpful, I think, for our students in the Heritage Conservation Program is that um, uh, we have a lot of our core courses are at night, and in part because our faculty, our practitioners who have full-time jobs doing things during the day, and then they come to USC and teach at night. And so um, often you will have, you might have class uh, four days a week, but in many cases, um, you know, we, we try to cluster like one day, like you might have three classes on a Monday, but then Tuesday and Wednesday night, you would also have class, but it would be, you know, from 6.30 to 9.30 or something along those lines. Um, we do have an in-person requirement. So um, all of our classes are in-person. And so um, there, there, are, there are very few classes that are available online, I will say, and none of them are in the Heritage Conservation Program per se. Um, but the expectation at USC is that you are here um, in person. So that's okay. it's a, it's a barrier to people, but, um, but that is in fact the policy at the university at this point, so. Okay, great, that answers, that answered my other question as well. Okay, so. <laughs> all right, terrific. Sure. Okay, other questions out there? Yes, okay, what would you suggest for prospective students who are interested in learning more about the field in general? Um, also, where to start if they want to get involved at the local level? Well, okay, that was like the perfect softball right over home plate, so thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously I'm completely biased and tell, will tell you that you should listen to Save As because um, it's an easy gateway into the field. Um, but there are some really um, basic resources that are out there on the internet, um, free webinars, uh, organizations like the California Preservation Foundation, uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I'm not sure where, you, where I, Chris, remind me, you're in Tennessee? I want to say is that what you said salt lake city utah. Salt lake city sorry salt lake city so um utah heritage um has programming they have a lot of information they're based in salt lake city um and they do a ton of um uh walking tours uh you know webinars all kinds of things that you can get access to locally um, which is often a really great way to kind of um, explore the city through the eyes of the conservation community. Um, and uh, so I, I think that's often helpful. Um, there, of course, are books that you can take a look at. Um, there's a, a book uh, by Norman Tyler about that's a basic historic preservation textbook that just talks about the field in general. We use it for our intro class to heritage conservation. Um, and, uh, but there's a lot of things that, I mean, you don't even need to buy a book to do that. There's a lot of stuff that's online um, and uh, a ton of resources that you can get access to without having to spend any money, which is exciting. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I would, I think that, um, thank you, Cindy. Cindy just put the link to the Tyler book in there. Um, there's, there are every possible gateway into the field, but I would say that really um, thinking about what's going on locally is actually a really great way to do it because you can, you can start to hear about the issues in the field. You can start to see some of the practitioners. What are they doing? Who are they? Um, it's about building a network. Our field is very small and, and everybody knows everybody. And that's really great. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, that network is invaluable. So um, start, start now, start just, you know, going to talk to people. People who are in the field are always, I mean, I have, you know, uh, I don't actually drink coffee, but I have coffee with a lot of people um, who are uh, just ex interested in exploring what it's all about. Um, I think we're all very eager to foster the next generation of conservation professionals and um, typically people are willing to do informational interviews with you to um, to tell you about you know the work that they're doing or a project that they're doing uh, in particular um, and you you are doing uh, an, a, an architecture degree right you're finishing an architecture degree yes that's a BS okay. 
Yeah. So, so there are practitioners um, who are conservation architects who are working in Salt Lake City who I'm sure would be delighted to talk to you about, you know, because that is a, that's a specific niche of the field and we're always looking for um, architects who are interested in um, in conservation and frankly it is the future of architecture the existing amount of um, buildings in the world are immense there's just not going to be that many hero projects from the ground up happening anymore it's going to be so much about what's existing already and how do we how do we work with what we already have um, that this this is you will forever have work forever if you get into this field. Awesome, thank you. Sure. All right. What else? Other questions? Technical questions for graduate admissions guru, Elia? Okay. Well, so you have our contact information and yes, Kirk is great. Sorry, Chris, you're, that's, that's exactly right. Um, Cindy Kirk is um, amazing. I just saw him last week at the National Trust Conference. Um, I stayed in his house when I went to the Salt Lake City Olympic Games. Um, so when I say it's a small world, I mean it. Uh, and he's doing consulting in Salt Lake City. He would be happy to meet with you, I'm sure. Um, that's a great suggestion. Uh, so we, you have our contact information. Um, Cindy, Elia, and I are available to answer questions. Certainly, Cindy and I can talk more specifically about the field, about the degree content. Um, and Elia, uh, as I said, is our admissions guru and can talk about technical questions about how do you apply, what do you need to do, that kind of thing. Um, and so we are here to help and we look forward to seeing lots of your um, applications in the portal soon. Um, don't forget about the deadlines. Um, we really do um, hope to be able to provide scholarships to folks as they apply and um, because uh, sometimes financial concerns at USC coming to graduate school are a hurdle and we know that and so do, it, do us a favor and get your materials in by the priority deadline so that we can um, we can do our best to be helpful in that regard. So, all right. So thanks everyone. We really appreciate your interest and for coming. Um, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, and if anybody wants to stay back and chat, we have another 20 minutes on the clock, so. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing some of your valuable time and interest, and we'll see you in the fall. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thank you.